Don't let the future of high voltage cables shock you. How to prepare for the current and future requirements of high voltage assemblies. Hello, my name is Todd Troutman and I'm the supervisor of digital engineering at TE Connectivity's application tooling group. I've been with the company for about seven years now and in my previous role, I spent four years with our development engineering group designing new terminators and other crimping equipment for high voltage cables and beyond. So large cables are, have been around for a while and they have their own complexities that are brought due to their market demands and then also just their, their difficulty in how they're constructed. There's existing equipment on the market today that can handle anything from preparation to crimping, uh, but you have to pay attention to the future of high voltage cables and the automation that's required when you're going and purchasing this equipment. So electric vehicles are one of the next big waves of innovation for the automotive market. Uh, right now, EVs are sold at lower percentages than internal combustion engine vehicles or ICEs. But as time continues to go on and we get past about 2035, we're going to see more EVs sold each year than ICEs. And as we get closer to 2050, we're likely to see more EVs actively on the road than ICEs as well. So these types of vehicles use large cables, but what are large cables? So generally, when you look at cables, you can split them into three categories. You can look at small cables, which are anything smaller than one millimeter squared, or then you can move to midsize, which is one to 10 millimeters squared. And then large cables are anything that's greater than 10 millimeters squared. For those who prefer the AWG scale, that's less than 17 for small, 17 to eight for mid, and greater than eight for large cables. So these cables are already used widely throughout the transportation industries, including automotive, aerospace, and in trains. You'll also see them in energy storage systems, such as battery systems used in the grid overall. They're also then used in industrial and agricultural equipment. So these cables are more complex than smaller cables you see in other assemblies. They're generally a, a five layer cable that comes with some unique requirements because of the setup. So at the center, you have the, the current carrying conductor uh, which is then coated with an inner insulation that separates that conductor from the next layer, which is the braided shield, which is mostly used for EMI protection. That braided shield then has a foil shield wrapped around it. And then the last layer of the cable is an outer insulation layer that protects the cable from its environment uh, and also gives it protection from electrical current leaking out. There are some challenges, as I said, that come with this construction. Uh, one of which is dealing with that outer jacket. So this outer jacket is generally made of silicone material. Uh, so it's flexible, it's, uh, it stretches, and it's also mildly tacky. Uh, this makes it difficult to cut and difficult to keep clean. So when you're working with tooling to prepare it, you have to balance your cut depth to cut through enough that you don't end up having a large amount of tearing, which can make it difficult to align components uh, and even to do the crimping process but also avoid uh, damaging the layers underneath too much to the point that you can no longer get a good crimp out of it. In addition to this, the slug that you cut off on this outer layer uh, is much larger than say on another type of cable because not only are you stripping back for the inner conductor, but you're also stripping back for the braid and any components that may need to be placed there. Another difficulty is working with this foil shield. So generally speaking, this is an aluminum foil that's then coated with a type of plastic. Uh, this makes it difficult to cut through uh, between its, its flexibility and its durability. Uh, and because it has that plastic layer on it, it's non-conductive from the outside. So to get a good uh, shield crimp, you actually have to make sure you remove every last bit. In some cases, when you remove that outer insulation jacket, uh, it actually does pull the foil off with it, but this is not the case for every cable. So it's important to understand the process of removing this after, whether it's a manual process or using some potentially new technologies that will help to cause it to adhere to that jacket and pull off cleanly. The next then is working with that braiding underneath. So this braiding is cut to length uh, so that it can appropriately be crimped into the ferrule. When doing this cut, uh, the backing material is only that soft insulation of the, of the inner insulation layer. Because of this, you can't generally cut against it because you'll end up cutting through that inner insulation as well, which would expose the conductor. 
So what you have to do is generally use some equipment. You either have to snip around or use equipment such as our HVCP that gives a hard backing for blades to come around and cut and get a clean cut. If you don't cut it cleanly, you can kind of get this smearing effect, which causes uh, small pieces that are easy to flake off in the assembly, which can short out uh, a cable assembly once it's installed in the field. And seeing how many of these cables operate at 600, 800 or volts or more, it's really important to avoid any, any loose metal that could end up causing a short. In addition with this braiding then, it does have to be folded out and flared. Uh, so this is important because you have to have it evenly spread throughout as you take and slide the, the ferrule to be crimped over it, you need it to be relatively centered to make it easy and to make a, a strong long lasting crimp. Uh, this is uh, generally done by hand. Uh, it's a little bit of a time consuming process and it also does require finger protection. These individual strands after being cut can be relatively sharp. So to prevent operators from having them cut into their fingers, you generally need to have some sort of protection, whether it's tape or other device. And understanding some of the challenges, the, the best way to work through them is to have quality equipment. And so TE does offer a variety of tooling options to cover uh, most of what you'll find with high voltage assemblies uh, from cable prep all the way to ferrule crimping. So starting with cable prep, we have our HVCP, uh, which is a very unique cable prep machine. So many of the, the cable preparation machines you'll see on the market use a rotary motion. So they have blades that come in, rotate around a cable, uh, and then it will pull the slug off. The problem with this is because of the, the properties of silicone, it's very hard to get that clean cut while also minimizing the damage underneath uh, to layers such as the conductor or the, the braided shield that I was talking about. Uh, so we actually have an extra step with our machine that helps to propagate that cut through without the motion that can damage the layers underneath. So you get a clean cut while also minimizing damage to all those other layers even further. So we've very much optimized this machine uh, for its speed and for its uh, quality of cut. Uh, it's also one of the few machines that can handle the entire process in one machine. So you drop in your cable uh, and once it's done, out comes a fully prepared cable ready for uh, assembly and termination. It has the ability to be integrated with MES systems and also has a built-in trash container uh, that collects all the debris that comes off during the preparation process, making it a very easy and clean machine to use. So for cable sizes, it's capable of handling anything from 10 millimeters all the way up to 120 millimeters squared with a minimum cable length of 365 millimeters. Uh, it can prepare most cables in an average about 30 seconds or less with some of the cables taking even less than 20 seconds to prepare. Because of how we optimize this machine, it does use uh, different tooling for different cable sizes, uh, but we have designed it so that it takes less than three minutes to change out uh, a set of tooling. So when you're moving from say 50 millimeters squared down to 35 millimeters squared, it's easy to just swap out the tooling and keep moving on with your manufacturing. Uh, with this tooling change, there is an auto calibration process. Uh, and this is twofold. One, it automatically uh, checks the tooling and allows for offset. So as tooling wears over time, it automatically adjusts the location of that tooling so that you get the same high quality cut, no matter if it's a brand new tool or something that's already seen hundreds of cycles. In addition, because the machine knows uh, the shape of the tooling based off that calibration, it's able to sense whether or not the right tooling was installed. So if an operator forgot to change tooling or installed the wrong tooling, the machine will be able to notify them and prevent uh, the wrong tooling from being run, which prevents tooling damage and also prevents scrap and waste time. Moving on to termination then, we have our HV20. So once your cable's completely prepped, you have to have a way to terminate it. So our HV20 is capable of terminating up to 120 millimeters squared cabling, up to 178 kilonewtons of crimp force or 20 tons. So this machine's cycle is about 1.3 to 8.3 seconds and it's adjustable between there. This is highly important because some terminals, uh, particularly ones that have been designed uh, for hydraulic systems, uh, were designed for that slower speed that those tools allow. Uh, and when they are crimped, crimped at higher speeds, they can have issues with crimping, in some cases actually causing cracking. Uh, being able to adjust the speed on our machine allows you to use those terminals uh, in this machine as well, allowing you to have one machine that's more capable 
uh, and not having to require multiple different types around. It's also capable of being connected to an MES system and having a bi-directional flow of information. The HV20 also comes with our crimp quality monitor or CQM, which watches the entire crimp process, monitoring things such as, as uh, force and the entire time it takes. And this allows the machine to detect if there are any issues with the crimp, uh, allowing to you to set a crimp height value that it's watching for. So say, you know, maybe the cable was inserted too far and you got insulation into the wire barrel, or there were some strands that were missing, maybe you accidentally cut off a large number of strands, it will be able to detect that depending on the assembly setup and uh, notify the operator that there was an issue so that uh, possibly poor crimp doesn't go to a customer. We are in the midst of uh, developing a vision system for this machine as well that does allow it to do some pre-checks to make sure that everything is set up appropriately to prevent bad crips before they even happen. And it is a very well-lit environment, making it easy for operators to change out die sets, uh, to load terminals, and even to very easily load this cable in uh, without having uh, difficulty looking at it. And lastly, uh, there's also a, a vacuum system that is built in that allows it to uh, collect some of the debris that may be generated during the crimping process, whether there's you know, a small bit of metal that flaked off from uh, a conductor, maybe there's a little bit of the foil shield that was loose and flaked off. This just helps to keep that dye area clean, uh, maintaining high quality throughout the entire crimping process. Next is looking at our tooling. So our high voltage tooling has a machine readable serial code on it that allows for easy access to information about the die set to see when it was manufactured, what it's specifically for, uh, and can be used for tracking purposes as well. Uh, each of these die sets are designed for a specific type of terminal uh, and has locating features that allow for terminals to easily be uh, loaded in and will hold them in place uh, during the entire crimping process. Now they're also designed then to allow for extrusion. So with all terminals during the crimping process, you do get some level of extrusion, uh, uh, for smaller terminals, maybe it's only a millimeter or two, but for some of these larger terminals, you can see much more than five millimeters of extrusion. Uh, and if the die sets don't allow for this, you can end up getting buckling or distortion in your termination. But all of our die sets are designed to allow for this extrusion properly so that a terminal doesn't bind and is able to uh, release from the tooling relatively easily. Finally, the, the die set has to be loaded into one of our modular die holders. Uh, so these are designed with modularity in mind. So they have a, a fine adjust on the top that allows for over two and a half millimeters of adjustment uh, that's highly repeatable. So even as you're changing out different die sets from one of these, you can remember, okay, die set X was always run at D4. So when you load it back in, you can set it to D4, confirm it with a quick crimp height measurement, and not have to necessarily go through as long of a dialing in process for that particular termination before you're up and running again. Uh, it's also designed with a cable clamp uh, attached to it and it does come in two varieties. One is a manual cable clamp where you just place the cable in and you pull up the latch on the other side. The other is similar where it still has that manual action but it also has an air cylinder that provides uh, a locking component. So using a machine that has a CQM, if there is an error detected, say uh, it noticed a crimp height issue, it can actually lock that termination in place requiring an operator to have the terminal inspected to see whether or not it's good or if it's bad. If it's bad, it can be cut off, but if it is still a good termination that can then be saved and not become scrap. This prevents as much scrap and also uh, prevents a bad termination from getting into the hands of a customer. These die holders are modular in design. And so that allows you to put uh, any of our high voltage die sets into them. Uh, and it's also designed that the base plate comes off and can be rotated. This allows you to bring in a cable from the left, the front or the right side of your machine. Uh, and because of this, no matter what size or stiffness of cable you're working with, you can make this setup uh, fit into your cell appropriately without necessarily needing to rotate our terminator. And there are some advanced things to look at when you are doing these uh, crimps because they are expensive. These terminals can cost multiple dollars to $90 a piece for some of the very complex ones. And the cables themselves are expensive too at about $30 a meter in some cases. Uh, so you wanna check before you do the crimp, you wanna look, you know, does the terminal match uh, the installed die set? 
Uh, is the terminal properly seated in the die set as well? And then also, is that cable uh, prepared and aligned correctly? So looking at the cable itself, uh, one thing you can check is, is the cable size correct? So make sure that the operator didn't grab a 35 millimeter squared cable instead of a 50. Um, these large cables sometimes can look pretty similar and especially in an environment with you know, high mix, it's very possible that you could have multiple cable sizes nearby. You should also check, okay, was it the cable loaded in correctly? So you need to prevent having any insulation in that wire barrel. So if you have insulation in a wire bar barrel, it will mess up the crimp height, uh, and this can affect both the mechanical strength and the electrical conductivity of the crimp, leading to a much lower life of this crimp if it operates as expected at all. So there's also the wire brush aspect. So if you end up with insulation in the, the wire barrel, there's also a good chance that you'll have too long of a wire brush out front. And so too long of a wire brush can end up causing difficulties with assembly of this termination uh, in its final, uh, final assembly. Uh, but having too little can also mean you didn't get enough of the cable inside that wire barrel to make an appropriate crimp leading to difficulties as well. And then also there's making sure the cable was prepared correctly. Uh, so one of the simplest things to look at is the strip length, making sure that that uh, length is appropriate, and that's going to affect whether or not you get insulation and an appropriate wire bus brush as well. So all of these things can be checked by an operator. Uh, you can have them check each step of the process every time, but operators do get tired. Uh, good operators do make mistakes from time to time. Uh, so it's very important to have some sort of system that can do this check automatically, such as a vision system that can confirm all this and even lock out the machine uh, before it even gets started. Uh, preventing bad crimps from, from happening and a waste of time and potential for poor quality terminations to get out the door as well. So with all this information that could be collected, it should also be stored in some place that it can then be used and you can benefit from it as well. And one of the places you can do this is in a manufacturing execution system or MES. So what is an MES? Uh, so it is a system that essentially allows you to create and send recipes to a machine. So you can uh, dictate the entire part of the process. So you know it starts at this cable prep machine with these settings, moves on to this termination at this crimp height. It uses these particular raw materials. And then you can use that information to set up and track the entire process. So say you, you, know, you, you make your recipe for assembly Y. You then take that recipe, you send it to your HVCP machine. You go ahead, you prepare the cable, all the settings were set up and all of the information that was collected during that process goes back up into the MES. You shift over then to uh, your, your termination station. So this could be for both uh, terminations of the main terminals or also for the, the crimped barrels. So it's pulling that information out of the recipe, you're doing your crimps and you're collecting all that information again, whether it's crimp height or crimp force data and it's all getting stored back up together in that system. So if you appropriately, you know, collect all that data, are doing the validation steps and tracking, you can then use that data to optimize your process of your production. So you can reduce setup times possibly, uh, identify errors before they happen and actually reduce them, uh, which leads to increased uptime. And when you keep all this information in the long term, then you can uh, provide some traceability to your process. So say you find an error after you have a whole batch of uh, terminals created, you can then use this collected data to go back in time and narrow down the search of what assemblies might have been affected. So instead of looking through you know, 10,000 crimps, you may only have to look at 20. So it saves you a lot of time and the ability to uh, identify uh, what customers you may need to work with for any issues that come up. And so as demand continues to rise, cable houses will start requiring higher levels of automation and interconnectivity with MES solutions to meet demand. As time advances, machines will need greater capacity and fewer limitations on size and lengths of cables that can be processed. So we've split it up into about seven uh, levels of automation. So I'll be talking about two of them today, starting with level two. So with each case of automation, you're ending up with more complexity uh, and more ability to handle uh, a wider variety in a similar setup. So at level two, we're looking at you know, smaller cable modules with fewer or no connections. And it's to give you an example of this, uh, here's an example cell at level two automation. Uh, this is something that would be a, a good setup where you still have 
high mix and maybe low volumes. Uh, so if you look, these machines are all connected together with an MES system. Uh, so they are all able to talk together. The data is collected throughout the entire process. But you have a, a human who's coming in who maybe grabs the first uh, unprepared cable off of a stack, brings it to the HVPC, uh, runs that, gets it prepared, moves on, and then we'll do the crimp of the first side. We'll move on, do the crimp of the second side, and then finally go and crimp the shielding components on it, and then you know take that and put it all the way out. So this process uh, allows for a lot of flexibility. So you know, with the machines that are set up like this, it's very easy to reorganize your cell. Uh, if you need to switch out to other components, it's easy to change out die sets, it's easy to rearrange machines. Uh, and it's possible to even leave the machines where they are and just change the flow process of an operator working through your plant to actually allow for uh, simple changeovers. With a level two though, uh, you're limited by an operator moving in between. So you always need an operator to operate each individual machine. So because of that, you'd have to start moving to level three to start increasing your capacity beyond a certain amount. So level three now, it's smaller part modules without limitations or complex components. So you're still not doing your most complex cases, but you're increasing the amount of automation that you actually have in your given cell. So for an example of level three automation, it looks very similar to level two. You still have a human bringing in cables and a human taking prepared assemblies out, but in the process itself, your machines are now connected to a production line control system and there's automated components to move uh, the cable through all levels of assembly. So there's a, a robot arm that's actually putting the cable into the HVCP and then pulling it out and dropping it into a linear transport, for example, that then takes it to each step in the process and allows for a fully prepared cable to come out at the end. There may be some steps such as additional components uh, that have to be pulled into the appropriate location, but much of the process will be done in an automated cell like this. So keeping this in mind, you know, level two and three are just the beginning of it. There's still all those levels at the end. So as you're looking for machines, you wanna make sure you're, you're buying equipment that has had uh, forethought into what comes next. You wanna buy machines that are fully capable with bi-directional MES systems. You wanna buy machines that are able to be integrated into larger cells. So that way, when you start moving to these future levels, you don't have to scrap the machines you have today but you can just retool them, maybe update them and place them into more advanced cells in the future, allowing you to extend the useful life of the investments that you already have. So some key, key takeaways with this is that these large cables are more complex, they're heavier, they have a lot of uh, component complexity uh, and they just take more time to prepare and to crimp. Uh, there is existing equipment that is able to do this, but you really do have to give a lot of thought into what do we need now and what do we need in the future so that we can scale appropriately uh, in an automated sense as our markets continue to grow uh, and we start to see new opportunities come our way.